Good afternoon, everyone. I realize uh, we're closing the section. So I'm between you and your party. So um, I'll do my best to get a bit also a bit later. So you're all here to learn how a region, and specifically, can we get my slides up, please? So you're all here to hear, uh, to hear specifically how Scandinavia became the global leaders in mobile payments. So I'll show you how some of the retail banks became the winners and what services you need in your product portfolio in order to retain a strong relationship with the customers you already have, and more specifically, how you can attract new customers to you and win and your competitors lose. But let me give you some background. So in 2006, I had a simple idea. I wanted to enable people to pay and get paid using their phone. Now, this is before the smartphone age. And I later figured out that I was uh, amongst one of the first to have this idea and to, to bring a system into life to make that actually happen. Now, that idea grew into a vision, which again grew into a team that later became a successful company that now leads the way for banks uh, in an ever-evolving, changing market, and a speci specifically for mobile payments, that is. Now, let's bring it to the subject here. So what's up in Denmark and Sweden and Norway? Now, besides being card payment champions of the world, where less than 5% of the transactions are done with cash, uh, and besides being, you know, there's a staggering mobile penetration in this region. There's 150% mobile penetration. That's all the way up there at the top of the list. Virtually everyone has a mobile phone. Virtually everyone has 1.5 connected phones. So besides these facts, this part of the world has adopted mobile payments faster, wider, and basically more than any other place on Earth. And more than 50% of the population, and this is important, in this region, more than 50% of the population use mobile payment services actively. This is not tilted numbers. These are not adjusted in any way or pushed to look good. This is 50% of the whole population, everyone, young and old. So what's up with that? So the question is really why. What, has, you know, what have the banks done to win in this market, to win the customers? And this is where you guys get to sort of join in. So uh, I want to ask you, do you believe that what was launched was based on, let's for instance say, Apple Pay? Hands in the air if you believe that what they launched were, was Apple Pay. No one. OK. So option number two, in order to get half of the population to use mobile payment solutions, do you believe PayPal had anything to do with it? Hands in the air. No one. One. OK. Thanks. And finally, hands up if you believe it was something proprietary not even remotely close to the established solution, not even remotely close to Visa or MasterCard, nothing to do with Apple Pay or the NFC standard. Yes. Isn't that amazing? It's quite interesting. So a mobile payment wallet that has nothing to do with the established international standards. And why is this important? Now, these Scandinavian uh, banks decided to introduce a mobile payment solution that um, we're targeting uh, a different audience with a different way of doing it. So most of the, the and this is important to, to understand, is that most of the payments that a customer does, a retail customer does in a retail market, are actually domestic payments, right? If you look at your, your own payments, these are domestic payments. More than 95% of the payments you do are domestic payments. You don't need to adhere to an international standard in order to win your local market. You most certainly don't sit around and wait for an international standard to arrive. You just make something that you can bring to market ASAP, which actually solves problems for your customers. So the successful solutions of the North was not initially made to bring revenue to the banks. The products that they offered, they were designed to be attractive to the customer, solve real problems for the customer. They were customer driven. Now this is a buzzword that everyone is using, but this is the leading region that have actually deployed solutions using this mantra when they develop services. So you have to dare to think bigger and invest in a product that solves problems for your customer before it becomes a channel that you can monetize. So you have to invest in building that channel with one product, and then later on, you use the channel to generate revenue. 
which is a new way of thinking for a lot of the retail banks out there. You're very product oriented, not region or sort of customer oriented. So think of it as your chance to sort of make the first iPhone, right? Everyone has a smartphone now these days. Imagine that you have to bring to market a new phone, which is extremely expensive, but you have to give it away for free. When you give it away for free, you wait for it to become popular, and then you use the channel to make your money on apps. All right, this is a good example. Apple has proven this. So imagine you have to make your own iPhone and give it away for free. That's the notion you need to put in your head when you bring products to market. So um, these apps that you just saw, these are apps that enable customers to connect their card as a funding source. And through the app, they can send money to any mobile phone number. It's paying friends, except it's instant, it's social, it's fun, it's playful. It's like all the other apps that these customers are accustomed to using. We have to understand that these people already use interactive, engaging apps every day, all day long. Let's take Facebook as an example. They use this app, in average, in this particular region, 182 times a day. How is your mobile bank app doing compared to that? So you need to produce a solution that is playful, it's social, it's fun, like all the other apps that they're using. Um, paying someone in this ecosystem results in an invite, and this is the beauty of the solution. It's a P2P solution where you send money to one of your friends, and that produces an invite. The invite produces a new customer. The customer does not have to be a customer of the issuing bank. You just get all of these customers to drive adoption amongst themselves by sending money to friends in a social way that they're used to doing in these other apps. So that's the first step you do in order to build your market. And because of the viral spread mechanism, you take the market and you build a massive install base. And we got the metrics to prove this. This is how it actually works. So the app solves a real problem for people when they pay. Now they can transact in exact amounts instantly using your mobile phone number, not bank account numbers or cash. So you use your phone to replace cash and cumbersome bank account transactions. Now the second step, once you've deployed this product to market, that is to um, give them a new location and to, to uh, give them a new capability for them to pay. Now, once again, the North has led the way here. So, so many of the, of the providers out there, so let's say Apple, Visa, MasterCard, they've focused on bringing NFC payments to your everyday retail location. Now, the successful payment solutions, they've gone in a completely different direction. There is no problem paying in a store. So to win, you have to look for the problems. You have to find other situation that actually represents pro problems. So like this, ordering from a takeaway restaurant, you do everything from your phone. There's no misunderstandings when you do the orders. And the restaurant has no more unpaid orders. Both parties win. Super simple solution. You can deploy tomorrow. Or food to your table. The first time you meet your waiter is when, they, when the order is being served to you on the table because you did everything from the phone. There's no more waiting around. Or when you go to a sports event. You don't need to have a paper ticket anymore to enter, and you can order refreshments from your seat. Those will be brought directly to your seat. So instead of 10,000 people at the venue queuing up, you sit at your seat, and the venue comes to you to serve because you've done everything from your mobile phone. And finally, school cantinas is a great example. Most kids now have smartphones. But the cantinas, they don't typically accept cards. So you give them a mobile solution, solving it for the parents who can just send money directly to their kids. And the kids and the school you solve it for because they can now transact without having any hardware. The kids already have the hardware they need. The schools don't need a card reading terminal or anything. The customer just buys the product and proofs the purchase directly from their phone. So the system, they saw the, the, it solves many, many different uh, problems out there. These are just a few examples. So when you've solved the problems for these guys, and you have a massive customer base consisting of small and medium-sized merchants that now relies on your system, so that's examples like government, you have sports clubs, I mentioned restaurants and different contractors, and so on. These are underserved merchants. Once they are depending on your system, and you already have a huge install base as a result of the P2P, you've taken the market bottom up. And now it's time to take the rest. So that's when you bring it to e-commerce, obviously, making it super easy to pay online. There's no card numbers or anything, no usernames or passwords, just your phone. And then finally, you bring the solution, obviously, to the larger retailers, where, they, where all the other guys are trying to penetrate now. But you penetrated the right way because you brought all the customers into the store, and you've solved all the problems for them on the other end. 
and because you have all the customers and all the volume, then it makes sense to bring it into the store. And that's where you add value-added services like location, contextualization, you share data with the PUS. So this is what has been going on in the Nordics. This is how the Nordics have become the world champions on mobile payments. This is all proprietary. It has nothing to do with the established standards. And it's super easy to deploy. And that's how you do it. That's at least how these world champions have done it. Uh, there's also Alipay doing it from the other side of the world. They're doing exactly the same. And we have the platform to provide this to retail banks. So now you know how the best guys out there won the market using mobile payments. The next question is obviously how you get this product in your hands. And luckily, we're here. We're at the stand B32. Step over there and look at the platform of Waka. Then you get to see how it actually works. This is all very high level. You can see all the, the systems in play uh, and, and try it out for yourself. Um, there's officially 17 banks running on this platform, and there's obviously room for more. And for those of you who would like to know all the details um, on the technology that we have uh, that are um, interested in what's happening on the back end, we will be more than happy to share that. We'll also get some insights from our friends from Google. So it's time for me to introduce my good friend and colleague, Otso Jontonen from Google. And you may wonder how the leading mobile payment innovators uh, and bank platform vendor for Norway shares the stage with Google. So in order for us to innovate and do what we've done, we've not spent time on building computers, patching computers, maintaining uh, infrastructure and keeping it safe and sound. We left that to the engineers, and those engineers are Google. So also, take it away. So Daniel uh, introduced me, and I was introduced as the head of uh, Google Cloud Platform in the Nordic market. But uh, I could use also a name or a title CIO of uh, AUKA, because basically Daniel has outsourced all his IT operations to Google. So I'm going to do a um, challenging presentation. So I'm going to cram in two presentations. I'm trying to tell you what is cloud platform, which takes months to understand what this actually is. So I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do two demos. I'm going to do a, ma a machine learning demo and querying a huge amount of data while I'm actually speaking with you. Uh, so um, any of you um, fiddle with IT? So I have here a um, table, database table, that is sitting in US. And uh, it seems that the resolution gives me tricks, but it's basically one petabyte of data. So it's over one trillion rows of data. It's, a, it's a from, uh, from a retail company. So typical, typically, when you have uh, data lakes in companies, they typically range from hundreds of gigabytes to a few terabytes. And then companies say that they have lots of data. So I have here a demonstration um, table that is one petabyte of data, that is one trillion rows. So I'm going to put it to run a table scan on it. So I'm going to scan a table of one trillion rows so now it started, so the query is running, and then I go back to my presentation. So when you typically think about Google, this is what you think. So it's a search company. So it's a white page with a, you enter a query, and then you get answers. But when I think of Google, it's actually this. Google is, uh, well, it's search, but then it's, it's email, it's maps, it's uh, you know, Android, it's YouTube. And there's some interesting figures there. Just for YouTube, uh, every minute when it goes during my presentation, which is now six minutes, so it's 600 hours of video is uploaded globally in YouTube. So you, you can imagine how, how Google's infrastructure needs to flex and grow all the time. Uh, and we also have Cloud Platform, which actually is, enables companies such as AUKA or any, any of your companies to run your IT infrastructure on top of Google. So what this actually means that Google actually ran out of puff in IT, in traditional IT, already during the 90s. So we actually had to find a way how we can manage this kind of information, this amount of information. And we had to build a cloud for ourselves. So that's what Google started. So we had to create huge data centers globally and create a huge network between the companies, or between the data centers to actually manage and uh, a few years ago, Google decided to give this infrastructure to all the companies in the world. So this is, this is a number around 10 billion last year. This is just a number how much, 
how much Google invests, that Google investments. A huge part of that is actually in IT infrastructure. Uh, not many of you know, but Google is the fourth largest server manufacturer. So we basically manufacture all our own servers, all our switches. Basically, the whole infrastructure is made by Google. Um, and uh, basically, also a lot of IT concepts during the last, let's say, 15 years have come from Google. To cope with the data amounts, we had to create our own file systems, which became HTFS, is available in the market nowadays. We did MapReduce, which became Hadoop. Etc. Etc. And then Google decided four or five years ago that why don't we externalize the technologies that we have been using internally so that everyone can use them. So what does it actually mean? This means that Google is offering a third wave of cloud. That's what we talk about. So if short IT history, so you used to run your own IT, then you co-located it, you asked a vendor to manage your IT, then became Azure, uh, Amazon which actually enabled you to buy virtual machines via internet. And that's cool, but that's still yours to manage. That's what we call IT as of now. So you buy individual virtual machines, but you need to manage those. The third wave of cloud is that everything is automatic, meaning that Google is managing the clusters, Google is having uh, machine learning algorithms that you can use. Actually, anyone can use Google's uh, machine learning algorithms. They're uh, open sourced. Um, you do distributed storage, processing, machine learning, everything is totally automatic. Meaning that, for example, Daniel here, when he launched Auka, he just shipped it. So he made a prototype, and with a few mouse clicks, he put the solution in production. And then, when the Auka's business is growing, so he can actually scale globally without Auka needing to employ any IT operations personnel. Um, when it comes to data analysis, Google was born to crunch data. So typically, when you do data analysis, you need, to have, you need to have the hardware, you need to tweak the hardware, the databases, you need to have DBAs, all that. In Google, you just dump in the data and do the analysis. So you can focus on the essential. Um, and then let's go. So I'm, gonna, I'm doing in the background a query. So do you see the results? So here we go. So I did the table scan. The data is sitting in US. So under four minutes, Google servers processed over one petabyte of data. So to, to put this in context, so we actually rented over 10,000 cores in a server farm to do this. But we only used those cores for two, 226 seconds. Uh, to, do, to demonstrate a little bit like a live demonstration so you actually see, so I'm going to run another query from this retail data. So I'm going to find, for example, a, um, let's analyze the data with another query uh, in a way that we get, for example, a total sale for, um, for a customer from the same data set. So I'm going to do it just live here. So now the query is running. So I'm going to be using the same. So I'm one petabyte of data. And I'm going to find out that for one customer, what is the monthly sales? So now it actually uh, told that, well, it took 9.4 seconds. And it went through 266 gigabytes of data, like that. So that's a demonstration that the capabilities of data crunching at Google. Any one of you that is, has any uh, experience doing data analysis on the traditional database systems understand that the first query would have pro probably, if it didn't fail, it would have taken anything between one day or two days to execute, just to analyze one petabyte of data. So this enables our customers actually to actually use the data and query it in real time. Um, I'm running out of time, but I'm trying to stretch the limits. The other demonstration I'm going to do is our machine learning algorithms. So you actually see my, um, this is my Google Photos. So any one of you using Google Photos? I see two hands. So I highly recommend, I see three hands. So I highly recommend, I just actually implemented the Google Vision API, which is also, also available for any one of you through the cloud platform. 
So those capabilities have been embedded in the, uh, in the um, Google Photos. So you will see here that you know, it has facial recognition. So I'm just clicking a uh, face of my son. So as you saw, I haven't put a name. So it, it's not, there's no metadata. I haven't, it's not doing a search on metadata, but it's actually analyzing the, you know, the facial expressions and all that. So these all should be now pictures that include my son, Leon. And yes, so it's all about Leon. It's Leon with family or not. And uh, as you see, it goes through the whole archive. In, in addition to this, Google Photos, it does automatic videos and movies. So for example, there's a video from, um, that would be interesting if this works. So now I'm testing the infrastructure here. It could be that I'm running out of network bandwidth. But the Vision API also took photos and films and makes automatically videos. So this is actually a video from Money 2020 in Copenhagen, where actually Auko was doing a presentation. So yes, so this is a video done by Google. So just based on the photos in the archive. So it, does, um, it puts a music, so you don't hear the music there because it's just on my laptop. But this is um, basically video that Google has done automatically on the machine learning algorithm. So um, I'm running out of time. So this, is, this was basically me. So Google has created large infrastructure, which is offered to any company to use, including Auka. Please check it out. I'm here. I'm ready for any questions. And we went through uh, big data analysis and machine learning examples. Thank you for your time. <laughs>